Okay, okay, let's get started. All right, we're going to jump back in here on page 19 right away. I've got a couple questions here, but we will get to those as we collect them and as we go through this. Um, good questions, though. Uh, I actually just had a question asked to me, uh, and it was uh, my nephew. He said, you know, if, you know, why did God create Adam and Eve if he knew they were going to, you know, be disobedient? I said, you know, I said, it's a good question. I said, but I said, here's the answer. I said, because God loved them that much that even though he knew they were going to be disobedient, he still loved them enough to create them, right? And, you know, I said, the reality is he already had a plan. You know, he already, even before the foundation of the earth, that, that it was God's plan that he would send his son to redeem man. And he loved us that much that he even created us, even, even though he knew we would be disobedient. So, amen. That's the love of God, amen? But good question, buddy. All right, awesome. Um, yeah, so just continuing down what the Bible says about divine healing. We looked at the enemy is not a serious hindrance and can be overcome by any Christian using the available tools and weapons provided by God. You know, we also know that 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says that our, our weapons are not carnal, right? But they are spiritual for pulling down of strongholds, right? We're, gonna, and we're looking at that. We're pulling, or we're doing strongholds. We're going to even look at strongholds. What strongholds, a biblical definition of a stronghold is not a, a, a demonic principality, it is a stronghold built in your mind. So we're pulling those strongholds down. It says in number, number seven, point number seven, says the enemy can only be truly defeated by spiritual weapons and not by carnal natural weapons devised by man. Again, it kind of comes back to what I was talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You know, we have spiritual weapons. I mean, honestly, here's our weapon, <laughs> our word. You know, we have the sword of the, sword of the Lord. You know, the, the word of God is our sword. Uh, it's sharper than any double-edged sword, right? So we know the word of God works. Jesus... When Jesus was encountered by the enemy, he, he fought the enemy with the word, right? He said, it is written. You know, one of the things that a lot of believers got to do is we got to get some it is written so we can use those it is written against him, amen? Because the word of God works. Uh, number eight, Christians and non-Christians without faith for healing can be healed when Christians exercise kingdom authority. You don't have to have faith to be healed, Right? That's another sacred cow we'll destroy is, you know, well, you know, people say, well, yeah, if you just have more faith, you'd you'd be healed, right? Jesus never required somebody to have a certain amount of faith or faith at all in that necessarily to be healed. I mean, Jesus knew that he had enough faith to get it done, right? There has to be faith on someone's part, but you don't have to require faith on their part. Amen? We'll break that down and look at that deeper too as we go along. Number number nine, all sickness. Everybody say all. All is what? So everything, all sickness and disease is a work of the enemy, and it is to be defeated whenever and wherever it is encountered. Amen? You know, alcoholism and, you know, whatever, we could list a bunch of sins, you know, uh, prostitution, and we could sit here, you know, cussing and drinking and, you know, all these different things we could think of, murder, you know, stealing. We think all these sins, they're, they're works of the devil. Well, so is sickness and disease. This sickness and disease is a result, honestly, of sin, sin entering the world. There was no sickness and disease before, um, like my nephew said, Adam and Eve sinned. There was no sickness and disease. They walked in divine health. There wasn't any of that stuff. But through the fall, through, through man's sin, and here's something we have to understand too, churches, through man's sin, the whole world was affected. And see, that's, that's honestly uh, a ploy and a tactic of the enemy, is to make you believe that sin only affects you. Right? And that's, that, that is so false. Sin affects everybody around you. Right? And so the enemy will believe, well, it doesn't matter. You, know, you can do that and it's not going to hurt anybody. No, no, it hurts everybody. Right? And so we have to realize that sin is to be destroyed. Sin is to be defeated. We're, sin, honestly, we're to, we're to resist sin even unto blood. We're to hate evil, abhor it. Right? And we're to resist it. So sin, it's not to be a part of us. Why? Because we're free from sin. We've been, we've been bought. We've been purchased. We should live free from sin. Right? Same as we should leave free from sickness, because if sin is a work of the enemy or a result of, of uh, healing is a result of, of the sin. So uh, uh, he, uh, healing, <laughs> sickness, sickness and disease, sorry. Sickness and disease is a result of sin. Therefore, sickness and disease is a work of the devil. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says this. It says how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, which he did good, and healed all who were oppressed by the devil. So who does the oppression? The devil. Sickness and disease is not a work of God, right? And, and there's a lot of people out there that believe that, you know, well, the, you know, God made me sick. He's using cancer to teach me a lesson, or he's using this, you know, he's refining me by making me sick. You won't find that in Scripture. 
He doesn't use sickness to punish his kids. He doesn't use sickness to teach his kids lessons. You know, if I did that, if one of us did that, if we, if we, we pulled cancer out of somebody and injected it into our children because we said, well, we've got to teach our children a lesson, we'd be thrown in prison. Right? Why? Because it's child abuse. Our father doesn't abuse his children. He doesn't make us sick to teach us things. He doesn't need to do that. Amen? And so, but all sickness and disease is a work of the enemy. We need to realize it is an enemy, work of the enemy, and it's to be defeated whenever and wherever it is, 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 it is encountered. Um, number, page 20. Go to page 20 with me. I'm going to look at some principles real quick, and we're just going to go over these before we get, jump into the next section. Just real quick, we'll look at these, because need we need to understand these. Aren't, these aren't just... These are guidelines that JGLM abides by, lives by. These are rules that are set in place, um, principles that are set in place to avoid issues. And we don't, we, don't break these, we don't break these rules because if you break these rules, then, you, avoid, then you, you, you allow issues to come in. So number one is this. JGLM does not comment concerning your use of medical treatment. We will not tell you to stop taking your medicine. I won't tell you to do that. You won't hear Brother Curry doing that or any other JGLM minister telling you to stop your medical treatment. Why? That's between you and God. That's not between me and you. I'm not a medical doctor. That's between you and God. You know, if, if you want to do it, that then, hey, that's your faith and your position. But I'm not gonna, we're not going to tell you to do that. Um, number two, JGLM does not write begging letters asking for finances. You won't get anything in the mail. You're gonna, you know, if you put your email or anything down on the papers that we're going to turn in, you're not going to get emails from them constantly asking for money. They don't do it. They believe, we believe God brings every dollar in, and we don't need to, we don't need to, we don't need to ask for finances. He blesses us. Amen? So we don't write begging letters for finances. JGLM does not receive offerings of any kind during a healing service. We will have a healing service Saturday night. There will be no offering. We won't even sell books. It will not be there. Why? Because too many people relate healing to being purchased. I don't know about you, but it is for me. It's nails on a chalkboard. When I go and I don't usually watch too much of Christian TV or you know that kind of stuff, but I, I hear these ministers on TV, you know, so a $50 seed, you'll get your healing. You know, so a $50 seed and your family will be saved or whatever. You know, no, you'll get your finance. Buy this, buy this vial of water, you know, and you'll get your financial miracle. And you get people to buy vials of water and they'll sprinkle it all around their house. Oh, I, got, I received my financial miracle. There's nothing special about that water that you bought in that bottle, right? Jesus, Jesus was, was the holy water. And now you are the holy water. Why? Because it says in John that out of your bellies shall flow rivers of living water, right? So you have that living water on the inside of you. You don't need to buy a special bottle of it to get your, get your miracle, right? And so, you know, again, coming back to this, we won't receive healing or offerings during a healing service just because, again, people relate, you know, oh, if I give money, I'll receive. You can't buy healing. Just the same way that you can't buy salvation. Only by the blood of Jesus was it bought, right? So you can't buy healing. Um, you know, we do have... Uh, an offering plate in the back there set up. We're not going to take up an official offering. If someone wants to bless the offering plate, bless it. But we're not going to, and, and if we talk about money, that's another thing. You know, if we even get into money and we start talking about money and sewing, we'll just, we'll take those offering plates and we'll stick them in the office. Why? Because when we're not, because then we feel like we've pulled on your emotions to sew. We're not going to do that. When, even on Sunday mornings, you notice when I, when I take offering, when we take, I don't I even say take, we don't take, we receive. When we receive offerings, right? We don't make a big deal of it. I mean, I get up, I pray, you know, I say we're sowing kingdom seeds, you know, and I don't make a real big deal out of it. I don't pull on anybody. I don't say, you know, we've we got to get that extra side done or we got to do that. You know, we got to pay the bill. I'm not, no. We're just, it's time to receive offering. And we receive it. And you know what? God always supplies. Amen? So, um, JGLM number four. JGLM does not receive payment or money for any kind of praying or ministering to the sick. If money is offered before or after ministry of prayer, it will be received, or will not be received. <laughs> it will be received. It will not be received. JGLM does not blame the sick or their relatives for failure of to receive healing. You know, Jesus never blamed the sick when they didn't get healed. Well, they always got healed with Jesus, but you know what I mean? He never was like, you know, well, if you'd get rid of that sin in your life, or you, you know, you got unforgiveness, if you get rid of that, then you could get healed. He never required that. And we don't, we don't blame. We don't, we don't look to people's past and try to figure out, you know, why they're not getting healed. Um, as far as JGLM is concerned, the failure rests on the prayer, the one ministering, right? God's already done it. We're just ministering it, right? So that if there's any failure at all, it's because either we're, either we're what was our two reasons for, for failure? Yeah, unbelief and traditions. So we got to go back and say, okay, is it, is it, it's either a tradition of man or a sacred cow I'm believing, or it's unbelief in my life I need to get rid of, right? And so we got to figure out what is, what is it? It's, it comes back to me. 
Um, JGLM does not, number six, JGLM does not dig into people's past to try to find their sins before setting them free, right? Jesus never required that to be, to be healed, right? Now there is, you say, what about the issue with the, the woman that was, you know, caught in adultery? Okay. He said to her, go and sin no more unless something worse happens to you. Now there wasn't a healing issue there. He wasn't healing her. There was, they were bringing her before him and they were going to stone her because the law said that she should be stoned because she was called in the act of adultery, right? Now we know Jesus knelt down. He began to write in the sand, right? And we don't know what he was writing, but it could have been he was writing out their sins, right? Because he said, you know, you, with, you know, you who doesn't have, whoever doesn't have sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. And they're probably all looking at the dirt and going, wow, <laughs> dropping the rocks and walking back and like, we're not going to be a part of this because he's actually exposing us right now. That's what I feel it was. I don't know. We don't know. But, you know, again, we don't, we don't go into people's past and try to pick out, well, you know, what did you do to get this thing? Right? We don't do that. Right? It doesn't matter. What, I mean, even if you did do something to get this thing, we don't, we don't, that's not the issue. The issue at hand is we set you free. Right? And so we're not going to nitpick and try to find, you know, if there's sins or whatever that's keeping you bound. Uh, we're just to set the captives free. Praise God. Um, uh, number seven, JGLM does not try to find a sick person's generational curses. JGLM sets the captives free, not find out why they are captive. Right? And we're, we'll get into generational curses. We'll look at that. We'll break that down, and we'll show you how that's just nonsense. You know, Honestly, just a real quick Reader's Digest version. If we're going to believe that generational curses are true, then, then we also got to believe that generational curses are stronger than the blood of Jesus. He became a curse for us so that we don't have to be cursed, right? And so we'll look at all that as we go along, but we don't, we don't try to find people's generational curses. Number eight, JGLM does not blame the parents or, for their child's illness or failure to be healed. JG number nine, JGLM does not blend teachings that contradict biblical principles with the basic teachings of the JGLM divine healing technician training. You know, we're not going to blend things. You know, one of the things that we were down in Texas um, for the annual conference, Brother Curry was, again, just hit it hard. And he always hits it hard because it's, it's so true and it needs to be just drilled into us ministers that minister this gospel is we are to keep the message pure, right? Now, a lot of JGLM, or we call them JGLMers, people that follow JGLM or ministers through JGLM, we call it the message, right? And honestly, we call it the message, and it's the message because it's the gospel, right? It's not like we have some cult message, like this is, you know, this is the message. No, it's, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the message. It's what Jesus taught and preached, right? And so we don't pollute it. We keep it pure. We don't bring in extra biblical teaching. We don't need extra biblical stuff. We need to keep the message pure, right? I mean, there's, there, I've, seen, I've seen all kinds of stuff brought into the, to the, to the message, to the gospel. I've, how many of you ever heard of the, uh, I'll ask you this one. If you've heard of it, you raise your hand, it's fine. It's fine, I've heard of it. I'll raise my hand first. But you've heard this, this, this teaching that was floating around there for a while. I don't hear it so much anymore, but, you know, Jesus bore 39 stripes because there was 39 categories of diseases, right? And we, we, we think, we, we, I've heard it. I've heard that, I've heard that preached by people, right? It's false. Why is it false? Because that's Rome, that's, that is Jewish law, 39 stripes minus one, Right? Basically, the Jewish law says that you can whip a person 40 times. If you go over 40, the person that you are whipping has the right to pick up the whip and whip you now. So they said 40 minus 1, just to be safe that we didn't go over. Right? We, want, we just want to make sure that they don't have the right to pick up the whip and whip us now. So we won't go to 40, we'll just do minus 1, so we don't make sure we don't go over and get whipped ourselves. Right? Jesus wasn't beaten under Jewish law. Jesus was beaten under what? Roman law. Roman law, Roman scourging was a whole lot harsher than Jewish scourging, right? And so he took way more stripes than 39 because what the reality is the Bible also says that he was marred or beaten beyond any man or even beyond recognition, right? So they couldn't even recognize him on the cross anymore that it was Jesus because he was beaten that bad. 39 stripes, you're, not, you're still going to be able to see that somebody is somebody, right? And so that whole, that whole teaching, there is more than 39 categories of diseases, Here's the reality of teaching messed up things like that. What if you have a doctor that's sitting in your congregation that day, and they know that you're, that's not true, well, they're not going to believe anything else you say, right? Because why? That thing he just said wasn't true, so that, everything else he's preaching about Jesus probably ain't true either, and he's going to get up and walk out and say, well, I'm done with this religion thing, because it ain't, it's, all of it's false anyway. That's why we got to make sure that what we teach is pure. 
It is the gospel and nothing else. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that works. Not any additives. We don't need additives. We just need what he gave us. Paul even said in Galatians, if anybody else comes to you and preaches a different gospel, let them be accursed. Even if it's an angel, he says, let them be accursed. Why? Because we don't, we don't pollute the message with anything else. Back in the book of Revelations, what did it say? Don't add or take anything away from this, right? So we don't, we don't add additives and we don't even remove anything. We just preach the pure gospel. JGLM number 10. JGLM does not lift up any human or blindly follow any human. We, we just don't. I mean, why? Because if I'm doing this, you can do this. You know, even with John G. Lake Ministries, John Lake, we're going to talk about John Lake here in a few minutes. We're going to talk about some of the historical stuff, but did amazing things. But there was nothing special about John Lake. Smith Wigglesworth, another one. Amy Simple McPherson, uh, Mother Edder. Um, you know, I could name some. You know, all these different ministers. You know, Dowie, until Dowie got weird. But I mean, Dow, even Dowie, you know, had amazing miracles. None, none of them are special. None of them are to be held up on some kind of pedestal and, and worshipped and honored. They were a man that caught revelation of God's word and ran with it. You can do it too. Even Curry Blake, there's nothing special. You know, even Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter, not Ephesians, Isaiah chapter 53, that there was nothing special about him. That's what it says. It says there was nothing that we would desire him. There wasn't, he was, there wasn't any special looks. He was just, he was just a man. He, became, he came just as a man, right? So there was nothing special in the sense of, now we, he's special to us, I understand. But there was nothing special to him to be like, that we would desire him. Like it was like, oh, look, here comes the Son of God. No, it was nothing like that. He didn't come in any kind of appearance other than like us, right? And so if he did it, we can do it. So we don't blindly follow any human or lift up anybody or anything like that. JGLM, number 11. JGLM recognizes Jesus as alone as the only special one. In other words, we can't do this without him anyway, right? So he's the only one special. And, he, and it's, how many know it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? It's, it's by, by Christ that you can do all these things. Amen. All right, section one, page 21. Let's jump into this. Let's get some of the historical stuff here uh, out of the way. I uh, just forgot to set my timer. That means I can go for an extra 15 minutes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let's look at section one. We're going to look at the uh, introduction to John G. Lake and JGLM, or John G. Lake Ministries. Uh, we're going to look at John G. Lake for a few minutes because, honestly, the, the ministry is named after him. We should look at this. We should, we should see what he did in his life. And, and uh, you know, we can look. One of the things we have to understand, and Dr. Lester Summerall will always say this, and actually he was one of the, I think, one, closer to one of the final messages he teached before he passed away, is that we should always remember and honor the pioneers of faith. Now, again, not put them up on a pedestal because they're anything special, but we should, we should honor and remember them in the sense of we should, we should, we should even study out their lives, right? Why? Because we should, we should learn from what they did correctly, and we should also learn from what they did wrong, right? Because even John Lake had, had things that he said wrong, did wrong, and we wouldn't believe, you know, or it wasn't scriptural. You know, even Smith Wigglesworth, there were things he did wrong. We should learn from their mistakes, right? And we should grow and do better than they even did, so... Everybody wants to say, well, let's go back to the good old days. Well, you know, the good old days, they didn't get that many people healed. You know, in the good old days, if you went to a Pentecostal meeting and five people got saved, you were having a revival, right? <laughs> so, you know, the good old days, were, they were good, but we don't need to go back to the good old days. We need to do what God wants to do today, amen? But look at it. In 1870, March, uh, yeah, born on March 18th of 1870, John G. Lake was born on, uh, in Ontario, Canada. He had 16 brothers and sisters. Eight of them died from sickness and disease before, the age of, before he was 21. That was, honestly, that was John Lake's why. You all got to find out what is your why. Why are you in this? Why are you here? Why do you want this? Why do you want to minister healing? Why do you, this was his why. Why? Because he got sick and tired. And I don't even use the word sick and tired because I don't like using the word sick and tired. But he got upset that his siblings were dying. Constantly being held, hauled off in an ambulance. Constantly the coroner coming, picking up one of his brothers or sisters. He, he got tired of it. And so that's what drove him. That was his why, quite honestly. Um, in 1886, uh, age 16, saved in the Salvation Army meeting. Uh, he moved to the U.S. after he, be, after he was born again. Uh, Salva Salvation Army, we all know that was started by who? William Booth. Right? And that's another, that's another powerful man of God that you should study his life out. The, the revelation that William Booth got of, of reaching the lost. I mean, his, his church services were at the brothels, the prostitution places. That's where, his, that's where he had his church services. They'd bring him back to his, the army barracks, in the Salvation Army, they called it a barracks, 
they would train up these girls and stuff and get them born again. And, or, well, they'd get them born again at the prostitution hall, but they'd come back, train them, get them, get them raised up, get them equipped, and then they'd be the ones back there preaching to their fellow workers that they were working with the previous week. That was his ministry. It was pretty awesome. So, so Blake got saved through the Salvation Army meeting. He moved to the U.S. in 1891 at the age of 21, uh, became an ordained Methodist minister. Did not go into ministry, but he actually started two newspapers. 1893, at the age of 20, 23, he married Jenny Stevens, um, and who suffered from heart problems. Uh, at that point, too, he also associated himself with John Alexander Dowie, uh, which John Alexander Dowie was, was the uh, minister who started the Zion, uh, city of Zion in Illinois. Um, you know, John Alexander Dowie, I'll just talk about him for, for a few seconds. He, he, he had an amazing healing ministry. He didn't even believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He didn't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. He didn't believe in that, but yet he, he got a hold of the revelation that you could lay your hands on the sick and they'd be healed. It was so, so much so that even in, even in Zion, uh, in the city of Zion, they wouldn't even allow medicine in there. I mean, they wouldn't allow doctors in there. I mean, it was just they believed God's Word, and uh, there's, there's multiple testimonies of, you know, of things happening, people dying, being raised back up. I mean, wounds and sicknesses and diseases, no medical doctors, no treatment. Them just laying hands, healed. I mean, just, just amazing, amazing stuff. And again, just because Dowie got a hold of the revelation that healing is for today. And so, you know, even without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, still walked in it. So it's kind of neat. But he, uh, he, he became associated with Dowie, uh, ran with Dowie's ministry for a while. He became a deacon and an elder in Dowie's organization. Um, at 1901, age 31, moved to Zion to study and work directly with Dowie. Uh, he had said, I'm going, to, I'm going to Zion to study divine healing so I can teach it. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, well, I mean, Curry's actually going to talk about it here in a minute in a second, but um, one of the reasons he went with Lake, or, I, or actually really studied, the, studied Lake's ministry for a long time, was because Lake reproduced himself. You know, where he looked at, looked at Smith Wigglesworth and others, and they did, they did amazing things. They had amazing ministries and, and did revival campaigns, and many people healed, saved, delivered, all that. They never reproduced themselves. They never taught anybody. They never, he, the only one he really saw discipling others to do the same thing was through Lake. And so Lake did that. Lake, Lake, Lake said early on when he went to Zion, he was going to, to study it so that he could teach it. He could reproduce it. Um, Dowie Zion did collapse. Dow, Dow, Dowie got really weird at the end. I mean, he, it was honestly, and it was because of the people he surrounded himself with. It is so crucial to those who you surround yourself with. And he got really strange at the end and even, even, you know, through throwing off wise counsel or ignoring wise counsel, he thought he was Elijah, he, and he got really strange, and that's really when things happened, went south for Dowie. He started good, you know, and, but he didn't end so well. So we should always want to start well and end well. Amen? Finish the race well. But Dowie, Dowie Zion did collapse. Charles Parham holds Pentecostal meeting in Zion in 1906. Um, there's strong opposition to that. Why? Because Dowie didn't believe in the speaking in tongues and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. And so there was major opposition to that. F.F. Um, F. Bosworth, how many have heard of that, that man of God? F.F. F. Bosworth ran with Lake for a long time. Um, and Margie Bur uh, Burgess were first to receive the Holy Spirit baptism. Persons be persecutions became so strong that F.F. F. Bosworth left Zion and moved to Dallas, Texas, where he started the full gospel tabernacle, the first assembly of God. That was actually the first assembly of God church. Uh, Lake receives the Holy Spirit baptism in October of 1907 at the age of 37. In April of, oh, uh, uh, yeah, of 1908, he leaves as a missionary for South Africa with his family, nine, and three others with no support. No support. You know, they got over there. They trusted God for everything. Actually, uh, Brother Curry would be a better one to tell it because he, he knows all the information, historical stuff. He actually has a lot of Lake's write, original things, writings, journals. I mean, he's... Um, Gertrude and Wilford Wright, which uh, Gertrude was Lake's daughter, he was in contact with them for a lot of years, and they basically sent all of Lake's possessions to him, and he actually has all of that stuff now. But um, he would be better to tell it, but I know that when they went there, um, there was, a, there was a, there's a whole story about how, about how that happened. Basically, there was a lady in South Africa that was told by God the, that the morning of a ship's arrival that there's going to be a, a, an American family waiting at the ports. You were to give that. I think she had an extra home or something. You're to go to give them and house them. And so she hears that from God. She goes down to the porch and she's waiting there and she sees people coming off and here she sees this family and she runs up to them and, you know, Are you guys American? And she knew right away it was, it was that family. So they went with no support. They went with literally nothing in their pockets and yet God provided for everything. 
That's, that's what God does. When, when, it's, when it's God, he will provide everything. Amen? So they go, no support. Uh, in uh, May of 1908, he arrives in Johannesburg where he converts a Dowie church and takes it over, right? Which is kind of interesting. You know, Dowie, Dowie's against him, right? and Dowie's against the baptism of the Holy Spirit and all this stuff. And, you know, he, he goes over, and actually, if I remember right, the, the guy who actually had Dowie's church in South Africa was coming back to America on a ship. Lake's going to South Africa on a ship, so they're basically crossing, crossing paths, right? Lake goes over to South Africa with, honestly, probably with no, no ambition of stealing a church, but he goes over there, preaches in one of Dowie's churches. They all convert, and they're like, they all get baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they're like, yep, this is no longer a Dowie's church now. So it's just kind of interesting to see how some of this stuff works, but, but it's just interesting. But, you yeah, know, he goes over there, um, <clears throat> Takes over, he basically takes over one of Dowie's churches. In December 22 of 1908, Jenny dies while Lake is gone and buried, and she's buried before he returns. Um, about that, Curry's got some newspaper articles and he's got some things, some historical records on that. Um, they believed that she was poisoned. And they believed it was actually members of Dowie's church that did it because there was retaliation for the message he was preaching, for you know, the revelation of the Holy Spirit baptism he was bringing. It was retali- That's how offended they were at this message, right? And so, again, like I said Wednesday night, I, I say it all the time, you know, they, they crucified Jesus for his teachings, for the message, right? And so here, they're so offended at the message that Lake brings that while he's out, he's actually out in the African bush doing outreach, they poison, they basically poison the water system. They would actually, if, if I'm correct, and Curry can correct me, he can call me and let me know if I'm wrong, but they would actually gather water um, in buckets that basically rainwater, and that's what they would use for washing and drinking, and they would boil it and things. And, um, they actually had poisoned the buckets, and she drank it, she ends up dying. Now, here's what it says here. Remember, it says that she's buried before he even returns, because in their mind, here's what they understood. They knew if they, they had to get her buried, and they actually buried under so many feet of concrete, it was ridiculous, because they said if, if he comes back before we get her buried, he'll just raise her up. Wow. Think about that. That was their mindset. We got to get her buried. We got to get her ground. We got to get her under concrete because if he comes back, he'll just raise her to life. That's how. That's what he walked in, and that they knew that they knew the reality of what he walked in. So they feared him. They feared Lake. Really, they feared that he would just come back and raise her back to life. But unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. So Jenny, Jenny dies while Lake is gone and, and, he, and is buried before he returns. You think most men, most men of God, or most people would be like, "Well, I'm done. I'm just going back." Lake doesn't. Lake stayed for five more years after Jenny died. He stayed there. He started 500 native churches and over 125 white churches. Lake stopped a plague, which we all know the story of that. He stopped a plague and demonstrated dominion over disease and germs. You all heard the story. Actually, I just seen um, Brother Tom Scarella. He posted yesterday, a friend of mine. He, he actually was here and ministered with us a couple months ago, but he shared the whole story again with Lake and that. He said that, you know, he went in, the doctors were basically scraping this foam off of the lungs of the dead people. They were studying. They were doing studies and stuff. And Lake told them, you know, take that foam that is infested with this plague off their lungs and put it in my hand and look it under the microscope. He says, I tell you right now, he says, it will die as soon as it touches me. They didn't believe him. So they said, okay, well, they thought he was a crazy man. He's like, well, you must have a death wish, right? Because they they think you're just going to die if you get this plague on you. So he puts his hand under the microscope. They take some of that foam and they spread it across his hand. And as they watch it under the microscope, everything that was squirming on there literally died. And they said, how does this happen? And, and, he, and, he, and he said, he says, it's, it's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that has made me free from the law of sin and death. So it's the spirit of the life of Christ Jesus that's in me that has made me free from the law of sin and death, right? Sin and death involve sickness and disease. It sets me free. So there's two laws that we can follow. We can follow the law of life in Christ Jesus that brings life through the spirit, or we can follow the law of sin and death. It's two laws. I don't know about you, but I'm going to line up with the law of the spirit of life, Christ Jesus, right? So again, that's, that's how he could do that. But again, he knew who he was. He knew who he was, and he knew who was in him. It was the Holy Spirit. Um, yeah, so there was some jealousy that started over there. Bowie and Cooper convinced, uh, convinced Lake's partners, uh, Thomas Hesmaholch, to try to overthrow Lake. Again, just, just a lot of opposition. Lake faced opposition after opposition. Um, They wrote letters to America to Lake's supporters saying that Lake was misusing funds. Finances were instantly stopped uh, until an investigation was taking place. Uh, Money became so low that Lake had to call his missionaries from the field. He explained the situation. They held communion. 
went back to the field, buried 14 men and women. Investigations proved that Lake was innocent. Again, it was just opposition that Lake faced because of the message and the teachings and, and the miracles. You know, the, the reality of this is, is the enemy does not like it when men and women of God walk in their divine calling, which is to walk as a son of God, right? And to minister healing and to set people free and to preach the gospel and to feed the hungry. The enemy doesn't like it, and he will at all costs try to stop it. Even if it comes to false accusations, he will try to prove somebody that they're, 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 you're guilty, but they prove that Lake was innocent. Um, February 1st, 1913, at the age of 43, Lake returns to the U.S. with his children permanently. Uh, September of 1913, Lake marries uh, Florence Schweitzer, um, and it has her birth and, and death date there behind that. Um, in January 1914, Lake visits England, where he meets a group called the International Pentecostal Council. He decides to found the International Apostolic Council. So he got the idea from them in, in England. Lake comes back to the U.S. He forms the International Apostolic Council, which is currently who I am, I am licensed through. Uh, that ministry is still to this day running and active in operation. A uh, little, little kind of nugget there. It's actually older than the Assemblies of God. It was actually formed before the Assemblies of God was formed, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And so it's a pretty old organization. Obviously, we can see this here, right? And, and I don't know if you know this, but Lake actually sat on the board of directors, or the, I should say, the board that was basically forming the Assemblies of God. He sat on that board when they formed the Assemblies of God, and he was actually against it. And it wasn't because he was like, oh, I want my ministry to flourish, and it wasn't that. He, he, he listened to people, and he, he heard what they were talking about, and what they, they wanted to organize things, right? Now we know we can't organize God out of this. Right? We can organize, and organizing is okay, but when you get organized so much where it's like, we're just going to organize the Holy Ghost out of this, that's what he saw, and that's what he feared. And he actually says, I fear this will become another dumb, dead religion. And I'm not going to say anything against the Assemblies of God today, but I'll leave it at that. So, Lake, Lake actually voted against it, that the Assemblies of God be formed, but it was still formed. Um, one of the things, too, where it says here that Lake, in 1913, Lake marries Florence Schweitzer, we owe a lot of gratitude to Florence, his wife, his second wife, uh, because a lot of the writings that we have to this day were done because she was a, um, what's the word? She was a stenographer? Yeah, she was a stenographer. So she would actually sit, uh, whenever Lake preached or taught or whatever, he, she would actually sit on the front row and she would, she would write everything down in shorthand and then she would go home and type it all up. And so we actually have access to all of his teachings now because of what she did. So, you know, many thanks to her that we actually have access to this stuff now. Um, and I'll even say this, because I know Brother Cray would even say this too, if he was here teaching this. You know, when you go to the stores and you buy things by Lake, and like I even have at home on my dresser, I have um, uh, the complete life teachings of John G. Lake. But if you go to the front of it, you look at the front of the very front cover, it says that this has been edited, right? And you'll, you will find constantly through Lake's teachings. If you go, um, Kenneth Copeland, he put out a bunch of Lake's teachings, right? And because he was good friends with Gertrude and Wilford Wright, and he got a hold of some of his stuff, but um, he even, he actually, actually, I... Actually, I think it was edited before he got a hold of it. He, got a, he didn't get a hold of it from directly from them. It came from somebody else. It had already been edited. Um, even Kenneth Copeland, he published it. it was, but he even has in the beginning of his book that what I have has been edited. Um, Gordon Lindsay, um, which was one of Lake's students or sons, spiritual sons, you could say, you know, he even published things by Lake. But again, in the front of the thing, this has been edited. A lot of the editing actually was done by Gordon Lindsay. Um, Gordon Lindsay edited a lot of Lake stuff, and later when, it, when he was asked why he edited Lake's material, he said because most of mainstream Christianity would not agree or like what he said. But here's the crazy things that they edited out. What they edited out was the stuff that worked. That was the stuff that worked. They edited it out, right? And so now Brother Curry, he's got pretty much, I, I know they're still publishing a lot of things. I don't think they have everything out. But I know, you know they're coming out with more publications. They're, they were, their goal is to actually publish all of Lake's teachings unedited in its original form. Um, he's even said that he's going to have it as they're bringing these out. And you will see throughout the next several years, you're going to see more of these teachings come out. And a lot of them are already published now too. But um, even the things that he's going to have, you know, he's going to leave it alone. But even the places where Lake said things that weren't right, he's going to have a little you know, box or in parentheses, he's going to explain why this isn't right. Because he said there was things that Lake said that wasn't right. You know? and, he, and, and he says, now think about it. Any minister would probably, we would probably say that about because everybody grows. right? There's things I said six years ago, seven years ago, that I would never say today. But yet six, seven years ago, I was in a completely different place than I am today. I've grown since then. 
right? And so I would never say those things. Now, there's grace and mercy. There's God gives us grace and mercy for growth, right? And the same was for Lake. There was things he said early on in his ministry. Later on, he's like, yeah, I don't agree with that anymore. But yet we can't just take those things and say, oh, Lake believes that. You know, if you heard me say something, if you find a recording of me saying something six years ago that ain't biblical, I probably don't believe that anymore, right? Because I've grown, right? And everybody grows. So um, moving on. Lake visits England. He, yeah, he, he you know, discovers this International Pentecostal Council. He decides to found the International Apostolic Council. He then returns to the U.S. and is invited to attend uh, the founding of the Assemblies of God in Hot, Hot Springs, Ar- uh, yeah, Arkansas, in 1914 at the age of 44. He attends but never joins the Assemblies of God. Uh, he traveled by train to Spokane and was asked to preach in a church. Uh, the church was called the Church of Truth. It was a New Thought church. Uh, this was of September of 1914. New Thought pretty much was like new age. It was, it was really, really, and honestly, you can see a lot of that in Portland uh, to this day. Um, you know, Oregon, Washington State, there's a lot of new age out there. There's a lot of new thoughts still to this day. Um, you know, his thing was, you know, my truth is not your truth. You know, preach your message and all of it. Yeah, preach, yeah, preach your message and all of it. Um, Irene, I don't know, this last name is poor, poor, poor was the first to convert uh, A.C. Greer, which is another minister that Lake traveled with a lot, uh, or did a lot of ministry with, uh, actually one of the books that we have out at the book table actually is The Commandments and Promises of Jesus. Um, that is actually compiled by Lake and A.C. Greer. I believe A.C. Greer did The Commandments, and I think Lake did The Promises, or maybe vice versa, I can't remember. But he did a, a book with A.C. Greer. And, uh, but A.C. Greer asked Lake to use the rooms on the side of the church to begin a teaching divine healing and praying for people. Uh, this is where Lake's healing rooms are born. So basically... This is where, you know, that's, where, that's one of the things that when Lake returned to the U.S., um, you know, he didn't necessarily set up churches. Now, he did have a church that he ran in Spokane. It was actually, I was actually talking to Curry um, like a couple weeks ago, and he, he said, you know, it was actually an afternoon church. Uh, they met in the afternoon, and um, he said they actually, I forget the building they rented out, but uh, he did start a church. But everywhere Lake went, he established healing rooms, right? And so imagine this. Now, they're in, a, they're in an area where there's new thought, new age, you know, kind of things all around, right? And now you open something called a healing room. Guess what? If you go to a place where there's new ages running rampant and you say, hey, we're going to open up a healing room, every new age person is going to come to that healing room because they'll be like, teach us everything you know. Because they love spiritual stuff, right? And so Lake opens up these healing rooms and the ministry just really just escalates. I mean, goes crazy. So healing rooms are born. Um, January 1915, Lake had moved uh, to larger quarters. He moved uh, to two buildings. The second was the Rookery building. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of, this is kind of where Lake really became famous, was the rookery building, and they ran these healing rooms out of this rookery building. So many came that he had to start training people to help him minister. Uh, he began a series of lectures he called the Science of Divine Healing. And uh, he actually did that. When he actually started that, he actually started that in a Masonic temple. Right? That kind of messes with some people's theologies. Right? Kind of messes it up where God can operate. Where, you know, people say, well, God, God would never operate in a mason temple. Why? Why is God ever, why is he intimidated by that? Well, I mean, that's nothing to him, right? And so they, they rented out this Masonic temple when they weren't using it, obviously, and they ran a healing room out of it. And he actually taught the science of divine healing. He was actually pretty persecuted for the, that, that actual title, too. And it, why he called it the science of divine healing, he wanted people to understand how easy this was. There's actually a story of Lake uh, as he is, he's coming out of a, uh, one of his times where he's teaching the science of divine healing at this Masonic temple. And this woman brings a child to, her, to, to him. And he picks up the child, and he looks at the child, and he notices the child has no foot. And this is really early on in Lake's healing room thing, room ministry. It's kind of what really got him started. I mean, it got him people just coming more and more and more. So he's holding this child. He realizes it has no foot. It's just literally just a, a, a stub there. And he's standing at, he's literally standing at the entrance of this Masonic temple that he just got done teaching in. And he grabs a hold of this child and he prays over this child, grabs a hold of that stub, right? And he hands the child back to the mother. And he goes on, he begins to walk down the street, down the sidewalk. And the mother just lets out a scream. The crowd goes crazy. He turns around and the child has a foot. And now they're, they're actually, the child, but the child's kind of stumbling around, so they're, they're walking with the child, and they're trying to get the child, and you know, they're, they're teaching the child how to use this new foot that this child's never had. And honestly, Lake's ministry just escalated. And I say Lake's ministry, it's Jesus' ministry, but it, he became very popular. Why, even more people started coming to him now, right? And so he started training people because he realized 
Lake realized the same thing Jesus realized. And, and Jesus realized he couldn't do it all, right? Because he was even, even Jesus himself was limited to being in one place at one time. So he had to train others to do it. So Lake got that vision, said, I got to train people. Why? Because I can't, I, I'm just, I'm one man. I got to train people to do the same thing I'm doing. So he begins to train these ministers to help him. Um, when people came for prayer, he required them to commit every, yeah, he required them to commit to coming every 30 days. He also required them to leave their medicine at the healing rooms. Uh, you weren't allowed to bring medicine in, right? And said so he, would, he would require that. He would, he would not take um, on a case that was not totally committed to God alone for the healing. Those that were sick, or sorry, those that were not sick, were trained in, trained in ministering healing, were also required to come every day for 30 days. And at the end of their training, they were given the name of a terminally ill patient and sent to their house to remain and minister until the, the, the sick person got healed. If they failed, they were not to return to the healing rooms. Their ministry was over. That's how he treated it. And Lake was serious about it. He's like, you know, this is, okay, go to so-and-so's house. They're sick. Don't come back until they're healed. Most of them came back. I'm sure some of them didn't, but most of them came back. So, because why? Because it works. It works. The healing rooms were in operation from April 1915 until May 1920. 16 men and women, divine healing technicians is what they called them, uh, we use, were used of God to accomplish 100,000 confirmed documented healings in that five-year period. I mean, that's, that's big for this, this time period, 1915 to 1920. Uh, that's roughly 20,000 per year. Lake's healing rooms were responsible for shutting down Deaconess Hospital in Spokane, Washington. Wow, can imagine that if we in this area could shut down a hospital? Because, absolutely, because we said, you know what, we're going to open a healing room. And everybody, instead of going to Gettysburg Hospital, everybody's going to come to a healing room because they know if you go there, you get healed. That's possible. Come on. With God, all things are possible, right? Dr. Lake, then Dr. Lake moved to Portland, Oregon, and, in a, in a, and they called him Dr. Lake. Honestly, he, he, he didn't hold a doctorate, but they called him Dr. Lake because everybody he got in contact with got healed. So they started referring to him as Dr. Lake. Dr. Lake moved to Portland, Oregon, and accomplished the same thing with a brand new team of DHTs. And the reason we call them DHTs to this day is because Curry, when Curry you know, was handed the ministry, um, you know, he had the option. He could have continued, you know, could have changed it to something else or could have called it something else. But he, he said, this is what everybody's always known. This is what Lake established. I'm not going to change what Lake established. He called them DHTs, Divine Healing Technicians. Um, and because he was teaching the science of divine healing, so they were a technician in this divine healing. And this, the name stuck. So to this day, we still call, if you become, if you choose at the end of this to choose to become certified, you will be called a certified DHT. But those, uh, he started a whole brand new group of DHTs, 100,000 healings, um, um, 100, 100, healings in five-year period. Um, Lake was in Portland from May 1920 to 1925. Then he went to Sacramento, California, San Diego, California, and to Houston, Texas. While in Houston, Lake called for a DHT named Jeters to come uh, from Spokane to help him start a work down in Texas. Jeters arrived with his wife and son and daughter-in-law. Lake had to return to Spokane, Spokane and left the work within Mr. Jeter's care. Uh, Lake resettled in Spokane permanently in 1931. Uh, when Lake returned to Spokane, he found that, he, that the work he had established had closed. He bought a church building. Start, this is where he was talking about the afternoon church started a church, and opened healing rooms in the church. Lake lived in Spokane until his death on September 16, 1935. Uh, in the late 1930s, the original healing room, which or healing room, the building, the, the rookery building, burned to the ground and nothing was left. When the building was rebuilt, it was totally different. Lake never set foot in the current building to this day. And the reason Brother Curry includes this in this information is just honestly because there's actually a ministry that claims to be John G. Lake's ministry, which they're not. Um, the only one that truly has the rights to John G. Lake Ministries is Brother Curry. It was given to him by Lake's daughter. Uh, but there's a, there's a ministry that claims that they, they, they actually are in the rookery building, and they're not. They're, they, that, that rookery building was actually burnt down, as we can see. Lake never set foot in that current building. Uh, there's nothing of that original building left. Everything you have heard about that building was untrue. It was a prophetic fabrication. Lake had a total of 12 children. Lake's daughter, Gertrude, married Wilford Wright in 1941. They collected all Lake's material and held it until it was to be passed onto the person that was supposed to pick up the ministry and carry it on. 
One piece of material was a prophecy, prophecy that Lake gave on uh, May 24th, 1934, about the person that would pick up the ministry and carry it on. Um, now, you'll actually see the next page here in 25 and 26. There's actually some information on that rookery building uh, that Lake started and talks about that, you know, um, that, you know, that's not the same building anymore. Actually, interesting enough, uh, the new building actually has been condemned. Uh, it, it, you actually see it on page 26. The new rookery building, um, Reverend Blake prophesied during a meeting right here in Harrisburg, PA. Uh, I don't forget what year that was. It was a bunch of years ago, but he prophesied that it would be, it would basically, that it would be shut down, and less than two weeks later it happened. There was actually an earthquake, and it made the building condemned. And so people don't even operate in that room anymore. But anyway, uh, look at that. Check out that information on the healing rooms. And then there's also the next page, tw page 27 and 28. There is the prophecy that was given by John Lake on who would pick up the ministry. Um, when we come back, and we're going to take about a 10, 15-minute break. When we come back, we'll get into section two, and we'll look into how that ministry was actually passed on. Um, it's important. You know, I think we're, this is some of the historical stuff. This is maybe some of the most exciting stuff to you all. This isn't the, the, you know, the necessary, the meat or the good stuff, but it's important because we need to know the foundation of where did this get started and why is this teaching so valuable. So let's take a break, a 10-minute break or so, and then we'll come back and we'll start on section two. Amen? Amen. Amen.